Let's start with the obvious. While they're a hot topic today, disinformation, misinformation, and hate speech, they're hardly new. Let's be honest, from the moment we homo sapiens could talk, we spread lies and insulted one another. What is new is the way that fake news, conspiracies, and other digital harms are being supercharged by digital connectivity. Our collective dependence on satellites, data centers, deep sea cables, digital devices, online platforms, and the algorithms that power them is amplifying the scale and speed of digital harm. As I'll explain, the spread of these online threats add a deeply troubling dimension to armed conflicts around the world. Put simply, the diffusion of digital harms have real-world consequences, from Afghanistan to Zimbabwe. They shape access or not to everything from security and privacy to access to water, food, and health care. They can, quite literally, determine whether someone lives or dies. Of course, the impacts of disinformation and misinformation and hate speech, they're not limited to wars. In a world of multiple and cascading crises, what some have now taken to calling a polycrisis, digital harms serve as an amplifier. Digital harms are accelerating and expanding virtually every single crisis we can think of, from climate skepticism and vaccine hesitancy to attacks on democracy and social polarization. Disinformation and misinformation have an especially destructive effect, though, in war zones, where people are hyper-dependent on reliable information just to survive. Now, I've spent most of my life working in and out of countries affected by conflict, fragility, and violence. And when I ask people in war zones what their most important possession is, they virtually always have the same answer. Their cell phone. And it's easy to understand why. A mobile phone is the key to accessing relief, finding refuge, speaking with loved ones, and building a life after the shooting stops. But there's also a dark side to the mobile phone. While phones are a literal lifeline, they're also a massive liability. And this is because phones and the information stored on them can expose people to unimaginable danger. In conflict zone after conflict zone, phones, the internet, and the networks that operate them are dual-edged. So my central message is that the control, flow, and spread of information and disinformation are central to any understanding of war in the 21st century. What this means is that telecommunications infrastructure, the highway through which information flows, is a strategic target. Make no mistake, a war is underway over the control of telco infrastructure and the internet traffic flowing through it. Now, most parties to conflict, they already understand this. Before and during wars, many governments introduce regulations to tighten censorship and block media content, as we've seen in the case of Syria. Likewise, armed groups often sabotage telco facilities, towers, stations, and technologies that power communication, as we've seen in Yemen. And some of the more sophisticated warring parties may instead keep telecommunication systems operating precisely to expand surveillance and geolocated targeting, as is the case with Russia and Ukraine. Of course, it's not just telco infrastructure, but also the digital traffic running across it that's key to shaping armed conflicts today. In many war zones, people are communicating not just by telephone and radio, but public-facing social media and messaging services. Not surprisingly, social media, an ecosystem, platforms, advertisers, content producers, and users, it itself is a kind of battleground. My company, SecDev, is monitoring how governments, militaries, mercenaries, and extremists, how they're using social media to spy on, recruit, defame, and target their adversaries. These aren't just isolated events. We've documented the weaponization of disinformation and misinformation in virtually every single one of the world's 50 ongoing armed conflicts. Now, if we're monitoring traffic, ostensibly to help protection and safety for those in, on the front line, you better believe that governments, insurgents, and crime groups are too, albeit for more nefarious reasons. A significant proportion of the disinformation and misinformation shared in war-affected countries, well, it's hiding in plain sight. If detected, it can be taken down. Take the case of Ghostwriter, a suspected Russian operation which uses Telegram to conduct phishing activities to steal passwords. Or consider Yemeni insurgents who use Facebook to lure unsuspecting civilians onto malware-infected gaming sites with devastating consequences for their lives and livelihoods. But much of the fake news, conspiracies, and hate speech and extremist content circulating online, it isn't publicly shared 
and instead passes through end-to-end -end encryption messaging. As all of you know, ETE poses a challenge for platforms and operators that are determined to curb the digital harms coursing across their networks. Yet, we're learning that balancing the privacy of end users with disinformation countermeasures, well, it's possible. For example, we've seen how Meta imposed restrictions on how frequently WhatsApp messages can be shared. We need more of this. But the added tragedy to the spread of disinformation and misinformation is that it's often the most vulnerable who are the worst off. Human rights defenders, citizen journalists, and peace activists are on the front line and regularly singled out. And it's the least digitally literate who are most susceptible to digital harms and the mistrust, polarization, and radicalization they inspire. Time and time again, we see disinformation heightening tensions, undermining trust in institutions and authorities, fueling violence and extremism, and shattering attempts to resolve conflicts. Okay, so that's probably enough doom and gloom. The question really facing all of us is what can we do to prevent and reduce digital harms? The first step is to understand them. Working in partnership with the UN, tech companies and local partners, we're supporting these frontline organizations from Bangladesh to Yemen by helping them understand the digital ecosystems in which they operate. This means mapping online content, the channels spreading digital harm, the content of the posts, and the extent of interaction. Once we have better domain awareness, we work with responsible public authorities, with social media platforms, with international agencies, fact checkers, and citizen journalists on solutions. Our collective goal is to promote awareness, education, counter-messaging, inoculation, and a rash of other measures to deter the spread of life-threatening digital harms. Just like public health specialists, our goal is first to diagnose, but then to minimize risks and maximize protective factors. We all have a responsibility to build resilience to digital harm. And what this means is investing in digital literacy and digital duty of care. One way to do this is by strengthening ICT skills for civilians, especially adolescents and children, so that they can use technology to fully and safely participate in the digital commons. Our SecDev nonprofit does precisely this, providing digital safety programs to nurture what we call digital citizenship. These are the kinds of activities that network operators and telcos could easily scale up, especially if they partner with service providers and charities that are working on those front lines. Given the telco sector's central role in ensuring digital connectivity, they've got a special responsibility to do no intentional harm. At a minimum, maintaining the integrity of networks that has to be a priority. And this means designing in resilience to anticipate and mitigate the effects of attacks on fixed infrastructure, power outages, and deliberate throttling and shutdowns. Telco operators also need to consider proactive steps to minimize threats, including depoliticizing their sector and introducing affordable and life-saving services. What's more, the telco sector needs to mitigate the risks of their systems being manipulated, compromised, and leveraged to target innocent civilians. Look, the strategic, regulatory, reputational, and operational risks of inaction, well, they're just too high. Ultimately, reducing digital harms means that all of us need to adopt a comprehensive, all-of-society response, especially in war zones. There's a key role here for government regulation, of course. Platform actions also are needed, especially more robust policies and content moderation in neglected parts of the world. Citizen action is critical for early detection, fact-checking, and building digital awareness, literacy, and resilience. In the telco sector, it's key to securing infrastructure and minimizing abuse of the pipes. Look, the only way we're going to tackle the challenges of digital harms in war zones is if we all have a shared awareness of the threat landscape. Because the truth is, is that AI-powered disinformation and misinformation and hate speech, they're going to become more, not less common in the years ahead. We are all entering an uncertain and unpredictable new phase. Algorithms are already starting to produce content that's indistinguishable from that produced by humans. Given the growing speed and sophistication of disinformation campaigns, including audio and visual deep fakes, AI may become the only antidote to countering digital harms at scale. In short, our digitally transforming world is supercharging the evolution and spread of digital harms. And this is precisely why digital harms are a challenge that none of us can afford to ignore. Thank you.